Um, but a lot of people wonder, you know, how do you build a company? And you know, obviously you build it with your hands, you, you work, you create, but you also have to pay the bills. And whether it's pay your bills and your food, your rent, um, or your employees that you want to bring into the company, you need money to do it. And so bootstrapping a company is, is hard. And you know, the, many of the typical ways of doing it are you know, called self-funding. And there's a lot of different sources for this money. Um, the uh, simplest way is, of course, just give up your own salary and work for free and somehow live without any salary on your own. And this works great. This is you know, sweat equity, and a lot of businesses are started this way. And uh, you know, it's the fastest way, I think, to get to a proof of concept and probably is necessary to some degree no matter what you do. Uh, the next one that's pretty common is uh, borrow from family and uh, friends, and so that's okay to a degree. It has risk associated with it. You have to be clear when you borrow the money that you may not be able to pay them back. This is a risky business, uh, risky venture, and sometimes that doesn't work well with certain family members and uh, certain friends. Uh, you could borrow from your credit card, and I strongly recommend you don't do that. Um, credit, you should never carry a balance on your credit cards. Just don't do that. Um, this is one that uh, is very tempting. Uh, if you are, have skills and you are already um, able to produce value for somebody, you can work on contract. You can uh, let them pay you for doing their work and use that money to then let you build your company in the after hours. And so maybe you, they pay you 30 hours a week and you go spend the rest of the time on your startup idea. Uh, this can work, um, but it is distracting, um, and uh, you know that that turns out that matters. Uh, velocity matters, and if you spend all your time handling the uh, contract, it doesn't work. I'll talk more about this, but small business innovation research grants are very good if you can get them, but the likelihood of you getting them is pretty low. And then finally, of course, if you can build something that somebody's willing to pay you for early and upfront then that's best of all. If you can build something and deliver it quickly enough that that revenue actually bootstraps you all the way, then you're set. And so these are all you know, nice, nice ways to get started, um, but at most they get you started. So I'll talk a little bit about small uh, SBIRs. So uh, I have known several companies that I've invested in who started their, you know, started their lives with a SBIR grant. And uh, it turns out that the uh, federal government's actually very good at this. This is one of those rare cases where government is good. Um, uh, many of the agencies around um, spend uh, some amount of their budget, which apparently adds up to two and a half billion dollars on these grants per year. And there's a standard process that's been built up that you, know, you describe the, what you're doing, you apply to the right uh, division or group, um, they publish products that they're looking for, and in general, they're not looking for exactly what you want to make, but there are enough requests out there that they're willing to say, you build this and it's close enough to what we're going that maybe you'll get the funding. And uh, what it enables you to do is you get up to $150,000 in phase one. And uh, according to some stats I looked up, uh, only about 15% of applications for SBIRs come through. So you can't depend on this as your business. But if you get it, it's incremental money that pays you know, perhaps for one or two people for six months to go build something that you needed to build anyway for your main product, hopefully, and then go from there. Now, if you really line up with what the, the government agency is looking for, um, you can actually apply for a phase two. This is much more likely. It's a 50-50 shot after you've gotten phase one. And you can get up to a million dollars for this. And so there is a um, website, if you search for it, that will publish all of the open uh, government tasks that are available right now and see how those line up with the idea that you want to build anyway. So it's, uh, I, I've definitely seen it work, but it can't be your main focus. It's not, it's not the single solution. You must have a path. OK, now I'm going to talk about you know, what is it that we're buying. And you know, uh, those of you in the business side have probably already covered this to some degree, maybe a bit boring, but I'll try and make it exciting. Um, stock ownership in a company can be interesting if the value of that stock goes up over time. And so I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, stock-based compensation in a public company, because that's where I started out in my first couple jobs. 
um, and what that means for public company and stock options and now these restricted stock units, RSUs. Um, but much more interestingly, if you're a startup, you start with a private company and you start with these common shares and then you start to bring in investors and add uh, the preferred stock and eventually build a cap table and I'll go through that. So this example is real. Um, this was not theoretical, this was my stock plan at the time. So in 1988, I was hired at the age of 24. They gave me 4,000 shares of stock uh, options at a price of $22 a share. And that's what the price was that day. It was worth 22. So effectively, if I tried to use them that day, if I could have, they were worth nothing because I would buy the stock for you know, 22 from them and sell it in the market for 22. But the theory is if the company's doing really well, then the stock will go up and I can still buy it at 22, but now I can sell it at, at more than that. And that's what happened. So SGI did very well. Uh, they actually had a stock split in 1992. And everybody talks about how great a stock split is. And the fact of the matter is all you're doing is you're dividing, uh, you're taking the number of shares and multiplying it times two, but you're also dividing the price in half. So in the grand scheme of things, it's an indication that the company's feeling good about itself, but it's a net zero activity. But it does matter in kind of how the stock options play out. You get twice as many shares and you get half the price on the stock option. So I had 8,000 shares at 11, but I still hadn't exercised anything. Then it split again and I had 16,000 shares at 550. Um, and there was a moment in 1995, a slightly delusional moment, where the stock was worth $45 a share after split. So I had, you know, at the age of whatever I was, um, 31, 632,000 uh, pre-tax available. I did not, I would say, exercise at that moment because nobody ever does. Nobody's that lucky. I had exercised some before and I exercised some after. As an example, um, you know, if I'd exercised 1,000 shares at $45 a share, I would have got $39,500 net after selling the stock. Now, uh, you know, I think I used the tax here, tax is income. I have no idea what the income tax was in 1980, I don't remember, but these days, at least 45% in taxes gets ta you know, taken out, state and federal, and sometimes can be higher. But that's still netted 21, and if I had done that with all of it at the time, I would have walked away with $300,000 in cash, which was not what really happened. Um, so there's another way to do this, um, strongly recommend not doing, which is exercise the stock and then hold it for a long period of time, hold it for a year so you get capital gains. Very, very dangerous, and during the uh, dot bomb crash of 2000, many, many, very smart people went broke because they bought the stock, waited, tried to wait a year. By the time they got, you know, the year came up, the stock was now worth less than what they paid for it. So they lost a lot of money. Don't do that. Okay, the other thing you can do if you go to a company, instead of stock options, which are, you know, slightly adventurous and some companies are moving away from uh, doing it publicly, is to do restricted stock units. And these are kind of like uh, stock options, except the, think of it as the base price is zero. So they really are giving you stock. And uh, they, it can be, um, the impact is very similar on, you know, as an exercise in sales we saw before, but it's easier for some companies to do. And it was what uh, Google did, it's what um, Uber did, and it's what uh, many big companies are doing now to give RSUs. Um, the reason you can't sell them the day you get them is they are restricted. So um, stock options, and I think this is the next slide, yes, vest, and so do restricted stock units. And the typical vesting period is four years. And there's also a one-year cliff at the beginning. So if you started a company and uh, you quit after eight months, you get nothing. Um, and that's, that's actually intentional because, you know, you didn't work out and, you know, the company is trying to give you these shares to retain you over the long term. They want to keep you with the company. And so they want, that's what the goal so they do that as much as they can. Typically, it's been four years well on your cliff. Some people don't do the cliff. Some people have said five years, and I've even heard of, but never actually seen documents on a seven-year vest, which is just crazy. Um, but anyway, you vest the rest of it. Um, you rest, vest the first chunk uh, at 12 months, and then every month after, you vest, begin investing the rest. And this vesting means you now can do something. You can either exercise your stock option or sell your RSU, and this becomes actually part of your income. So as you go out in the, in the world 
and you take that first job, you're going to have three points of comment. You have your salary, your bonus, and you'll have some amount of stock. And the sum of that, if it's a public company, you can actually calculate the value of this stock because it's just right there. Um, if it's a private company, it gets much trickier. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the other challenge you know, for companies trying to retain employees is that if you do this for four years, and this is a great employee, then you need to give them more stock before the four years run out because their, their compensation is going to go down. So you need to keep some way to keep them hooked over time. Now I'm going to talk about the much more fun and interesting thing and the reason why starting a company and why that founders found companies. So the advantage of starting a company is that on the day you start your company, your stock is worth zero, approximately. Some very, very small number. And that's important because you really do want to buy it. You really do want to get into that long-term capital gains category. And the day you have it here is really one of the only days that you can do that. So you get to kind of make up a number of shares and make up a price. And if you're a founder, you can write the company a check for $5,000 and you can own your entire set of shares. And then they're just yours. Now, you, there's some caveats to that that I'll get into. And the reason you do that is you uh, are doing this thing called the 83B early exercise. And uh, the whole purpose is to get long-term capital gains, which in the United States is actually still significantly better than uh, paying income tax. But the much bigger advantage, which uh, is not fully understood by a lot of people, is this thing called QSBS, or Section 1202. And it says that for the first $10 million a year in gains that you get from a start qualifying small business startup, you pay no taxes at all, 0%. So there's a 100% discount on the taxes on that, up to $10 million a year. And that is huge. If you're a founder who actually makes some real money, it means you actually make money with no taxes. And the reason the US does this is they want these, big, these small companies to start up and become big. It's actually very financially good for the United States. It's good for jobs. And it turns out it's good for their taxes because all those other folks who work for you who, in the company you've created are now making a big economic impact on your state and your country. So it's not just throwing money away. It's a good deal for the United States, but it's a great deal for a founder. So what does it look like um, and how do you think about it? So the cap table, um, is the capitalization table is kind of where is the stock? And you're going to see several examples in the upcoming slides. And you know, the founders, you, know, you if you find, found the company, your employees, and then the investors as they come in. You know, and as I said, I, I picked that five million number out of the hat. You have a lot of flexibility here. So here's, here's the example. You know, the company is kind of worth nothing. You have two co-founders. You issue 10 million shares, and you give 5 million to yourself and 5 million to your co-founder, and you price it at you know, 0 0.001 or maybe even 0 0.0001. You write a check for 50 bucks, and you're in. That's completely fine because you don't have, and the company's not worth anything yet. So you start to work, and you start to build something. What are you going to do? Well, you would really like to convince one of, you know, some employee to come help you. If you're two business folk and you need a, a developer, that's one thing. If you're two developers and you need a, uh, you know, business or sales, you know, you know, whatever, whatever that extra person, that first employee, you really want to bring them in. But what do you tell them? Well, you can give them actually a pretty good chunk of the company at, you know, effectively zero because the, you, you have, they're, they're, you know, at the moment, they're really just joining you on this idea. They believe in your vision. They think together we can build something great, but you, know, you give them a small percent of the company. Now note, you're, the ownership as a founder has dropped from, 48 to, uh, from 50 to 47 and a half. And that's okay. You'll find that that is an you know, excellent investment because you know, it really, your stock really isn't worth anything right now. So if you can get value for it, that's great. So now we're talking real money. Now we go raise with either friends and family. We go. Uh, go to um, our angel investors and start a seed round. And we convince several people, let's call five people, 100,000 apiece, to bring in money to the company. And you negotiate a price that is a pre-money valuation of $5 million. So that means the two founders and the first employee 
and their uh, you know, 10,000 10, shares are worth $5 or $5, $5 million. And so that claims it's 48 cents. So your seed fund comes in and you issue uh, stock to them, uh, 1,000 million shares. You also issue an additional million shares because your seed, seed uh, funders want to make sure you can hire your next batch of employees. And so you need stock to do that, so you need to sort of pre-allocate that. And that's very common in every investment round is there has to be enough stock for the follow-on employees that you're going to hire. And we want you to hire them, and we want you to motivate them. So that's what we do. So now your ownership has dropped to 40% as the founder, but you have some real money in. You can pay salaries at least to the employees, maybe even to yourself, but maybe not if you haven't decided yet. Um, and you start to build the company. So when money comes in, though, there is a, one thing to understand, that the, what you have as a founder is common stock. Almost always, what money buys is not common stock, but preferred stock. And in a perfect world, they're exactly the same. In an exit with lots of value, they end up being worth exactly the same. But in an exit with less than perfect value, the preferred stock is guaranteed something, whether it's one times their money, two times their money, to be in front of all of the common when things cash out, it's, it's preferred. It gets preferences. And so the way the stock is sold and the way it's described is that you write these preferences in. There is some negotiation here, but anyway, the, you, you're willing to do this because you know, the, your investors put real money into your company, um, which created mythical paper value worth $5 million. And so the difference matters in some non-IPO scenarios. I'm going to go through that here. So, this is a bit mechanical, but I, I really want to show there are many kinds of investments and exits. So here we're talking about putting a Series A um, preferred in. So in, in not 500000 but now $5 million comes in, and the negotiated pre-money valuation is no longer you know, the $5.5 million that we talked about before, but this new investor has con been convinced that you've built this great new incremental product and you're showing it demos to them and you've convinced some customers to say how great it'll be when they buy it. So they are willing to say your pre-money valuation is $12 million. So when our $5 million comes in, we're going to pay 96 cents a share. So that doubled the value from the 48. So 96 cents a share, the Series A comes in. And you know, they're usually aiming for between 25 and 35% ownership. This is a venture capital round that usually comes in. And they need enough ownership to care. So they don't want to pay a $100 million valuation and get some tiny fraction. They would like this. And you know, some, some investors will come lower than that, you know, a smaller fraction than this, but who knows. In any case, when these people come in, this is when things get more complicated because now they want representation on the board. Um, and so you better make sure that your Series A lead investor has somebody who they're going to put on the board that you like and you're willing to take advice from and you're willing to let them vote on your future because as a board member they have some but not absolute control. Okay, so that was you know, a theoretical uh, 20, uh, 24 months after start. This is a theoretical 40 months after start. Now your company's rocking and you're going for Series B, you're going for growth, you need $10 million. And you've been able to convince your new investors and perhaps even your old investors coming back that you are, uh, you're doing really well and they're gonna pay a pre-money valuation of $50 million. And they put $10 million in, $2.81 a share, things are going up, up and to the right. That, that sounds great. It is, mostly, um, your share, by the way, if you haven't been watching, your co-founder share has now dropped to 22%. And that sounds you know, like a loss, right? Well, you had 50% of zero when you started. Now you have 22% of approximately you know, $50 million. So somebody thinks that your shares are worth $11 million right now, more or less. Um, so that's good. Uh, again, Series B investors put somebody on the board. They also want to make sure there's more, more uh, options to give to the uh, new employees so they have a second employee pool. OK. This is sort of the uh, fantasy exit. Now, this is a bit dated. Uh, most IPOs are, are bigger than this now. This would have been an excellent IPO anywhere from 95 to 2010. But you know, in, in these days, that number could be a billion. Um, but I'm keeping it simple for the, for the math. 
so you, you go public at $200 million. And because you're going public, as part of going public, all that preferred stock with all those special rules gets converted to common stock. Everybody's equal. Every share is equal, 22 million. And the IPO price is $9.80 a share. And that's great. And so if you multiply 985 times your 5 million, you're at $49, $48 million that you, that you made over a, in this example case, I guess, uh, six, six and a half, seven years. So that's great. That does happen. Founders do this. This is, this is a good exit. If somehow you did a billion, multiply everything times five. That's amazing. Now we're going to go back to the less amazing exits and why this cap table matters. So let's say you get acquired after 60 months. So it's not quite as long, but you realize somebody likes you enough and they're willing to pay, but they're not going to pay the 200 million IPO and you decide to get acquired for 100 million. It works out pretty well. Same deal. You get $20 million each as the founders and your employees like that first employee gets 500,000 times five. They get two and a half million dollars out of that. So that's, that's a pretty good deal. Now, this is a weak acquisition. Somebody likes you, but they're not really, they, they just can't stomach a big valuation. So they say, well, you're worth $20 million a share. Now your common stock's worth 20 cents. And now things get really messy. Um, because first you have to pay off your Series B. Then you have to pay off your Series A with some minimum payments. So 16 million goes right out the door because they, they have preferences on their common stock and the remainder then gets spread across uh, all the employees and the founders. So, you know, it's not a zero, and the founder did okay, but it's, you know, not, not a happy ending. Um, now, this is much more similar to what happened uh, with intrinsic graphics, which is that we did get acquired, but we got acquired with basically not enough money to pay off the Series B and A investors such that they took all the money and the common was worth zero. And so in that scenario, the reason the acquirer is buying you is they either like the product and are buying the product, or they like the team and they're going to do something for the team, but it's not the stock that they're doing it with. They're going to have to give you something else because as an employee, a founder or whatever, you don't have to join this company. You could quit. You, you got no skin in the game. So usually they give you some amount of stock to acquire, and that's also what happened with Intrinsic. 